Ladies and gentlemen, the stage is set. The Bharat Mandapam is all decked up. The official start of the two-day G20 summit is still hours away, but global leaders have already started to descend in India's capital. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida and other global leaders have already arrived amidst much fanfare and celebrations. The pictures on your screens there. But all eyes for the moment are on one man alone, the President of the United States of America, Joe Biden. President Biden is expected to touch down on Indian soil in less than an hour and his first official engagement will be a bilateral with Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The two, ladies and gentlemen, have met nearly a dozen times in the past. But don't let that statistics play down the significance of today's meeting. This is the second one-on-one -on -one meeting between Modi and Biden in the past three months. The Prime Minister, if you remember, had visited the United States of America late in June. It was a state visit. This, on the other hand, is President Biden's first visit to India as president. In today's bilateral, the two leaders are expected to discuss key issues impacting the two countries. On top of the agenda, of course, is the jet engine deal, an agreement between General Electric and Hindustan Aeronautical Limited, HAL, which will see the two jointly manufacturing engines in India to power the Indian Air Force. Then, of course, there's the big Predator drone deal. India is buying 31 Reaper drones from the US for its armed forces. There are niggling price issues that need to be sorted out. Discussions are also expected to take place on ways to push the civil nuclear cooperation between the two countries. Buying small nuclear reactors from the US is on the cards. Again, price issues have to be sorted out. While the focus is on the grand arrangements and the presence of the US president, there is a big hole that has made headlines. The absence of Russian pre President Vladimir Putin and Chinese President Xi Jinping from the G20 in Delhi. While Mr. Putin's absence can be explained owing to Russia's ongoing war with Ukraine and Moscow facing a snub from several countries attending the G20 summit, Xi Jinping deciding to give this meeting a miss is being seen as Beijing's attempt to sabotage what is a glorious moment for India. The absence of the two world leaders has been much talked about, especially in the international media. But it cannot take away from the fact that the event in Delhi is going to be a big success. Question, of course, is whether we will be seeing a Delhi declaration. I have to put that question to Meera Shankar, who's a former ambassador of the United States of America. She's joining us live on the broadcast. Uh, as I said, less than an hour to go for President Biden to land. Uh, Ma'am, thank you very much, first of all, for your time here on Mirror Now. Uh, President Biden will be landing in India in the next 50 minutes or so. It's his maiden visit as president. Uh, what do you make of the optics and what are the expected outcomes, more importantly? Look, uh, the Prime Minister just visited the U.S. on a state visit where some fairly significant decisions were taken. So this is a good opportunity to look at what progress has been made on those decisions because the you know joint venture between HAL and GE for the F414 engine what progress has been made in finalizing the agreement between GE and HAL? What time frame do we have in mind for it? Because HAL has still to finalize the de designs for the Tejas Mark II. And uh, then the question of buying drones from the US, the Reaper drones, on which a decision had been taken by the Defense Procurement Committee. But I think the issue of price was still open and negotiations on that were to be held. So where do we stand on that? The third was, you know, on semiconductors uh, and uh, critical and emerging technologies uh, that we were hoping to create an ecosystem pulling together both the business um, and academics and think tanks, research organizations, 
uh, to create an ecosystem of cooperation between the two countries in the frontier areas of semiconductors, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, 5G telecommunications and beyond, and uh, space. So these were the areas which had been identified. What progress have we made? Then we also hear that there may be an additional item on the agenda, and that is discussions on cooperating in the area of small uh, modular nuclear reactors. Because you remember the nuclear deal between India and the US, and thereafter discussions were held with Westinghouse. But they didn't really make progress. The US had problems with our nuclear liability law. And though we had suggested various compromises or ways of dealing with it, there were also issues about the commercial price that Westinghouse was going to charge because at the end of the day, you would not find buyers for uh, uh, energy, which might be somewhere at 20 rupees a, a unit as compared to uh, thermal or even renewables, which are anywhere like uh, four rupees, a little over four rupees a unit. So who's going to bear that huge gap? So bringing down costs was a key element for the Indian side, because if it's commercially unviable, then you can't really proceed with it and create a big white elephant. So I, I don't know whether this issue has been addressed, but these are issues which will come up. So now they have abandoned this thing of having large reactors. They are looking at cooperating in the field of small nuclear reactors. Here again, actually the Indian nuclear reactors, the small ones, are the cheapest in the world. So I don't know where, how this is going to progress, but maybe there is new technology safer technology that we might get from the US. So we have to wait and see how this goes, but there's a huge agenda. Over and above that, I'm sure that Prime Minister Modi is going to raise with President Biden the question of finding some kind of a via media on the Ukraine issue, how to phrase the Ukraine issue in the declaration or the joint statement, because this is so far precluding a consensus, and it would require that the US and Russia, the US and the Western Bloc, and Russia and China, on the other hand, you know, uh, agree to find some way to work around this. Ma'am, this is the second bilateral between Prime Minister Modi and President Biden under 75 days. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, President Biden is expected to land uh, roughly 50 minutes from now. And from there, he straight heads towards the prime minister's residence for this bilateral. Now, you know, yes, you can argue that the prime minister's residence has a prime minister's office as well. But this isn't really the usual place where a high level bilateral will be held. What do you what do you make of these uh, of the of these optics, as it were? And does it tell us something about the personal relationship that the two men share? Well, actually, quite often meetings have been held in the prime minister's residence. The residence consists of two parts. One is the official wing in the residence where you have meetings. And the other is the prime minister's personal house. So uh, it's not as though meetings have not been held. But what I make of this is that there's enough on the leader's plate to actually discuss going forward. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it reflects the intensification of relations between the two countries mm -hmm. and the mutual trust that has built up in the relationship. I do want to talk to you about the Delhi Declaration and whether the United States of America and its allies will have its way, uh, you know, mentioning U uh, Ukraine in that declaration and whether Russia and China will agree or not. But before that, I do want to talk to you about the two big absentees in the G20 summit, Russia and China. In your view, is this deliberate? Is this orchestrated? What are Russia and China trying to tell India and the world? Look, 
I, I would put Putin's not coming in a slightly different category because he didn't attend Bali either. And he's not really been going and attending meetings because he is embroiled in trying to manage the Ukraine conflict. And uh, also, I think, uh, could be embarrassed by the West in the meeting. So I think that Putin's not coming is in a different category because he also phoned up the prime minister and explained to him that he couldn't come. G is not coming, you know, is probably sending a signal to us about the state of the relationship because it kind of puts, it's a snub to India, if you will. Even though his premier, Li Qiang, is coming, it's the equivalent of the prime minister. And from Russia, the foreign minister, Lavrov, is coming. So it's not as though the countries are not participating in the G20. They are not participating at the summit level, that is, the leaders. Uh, and Xi has uh, a lot on his plate. I think they had a meeting. He had a meeting with Prime Minister Modi on the sidelines in Johannesburg, which uh, really had two different readouts, one from the Indian side and one from the Chinese side, showing the gulf that there is in the appreciation of where the relationship stands today. The border issue continues to exert pressure in the full normalization of the relationship as far as India is concerned. So what is the signal we are getting from Xi that we can't expect any fast progress on the border or that the relationship is not in a very happy place? Um, the other aspect is that Xi himself has been facing pressure internally because uh, some of the retired leaders in China are believed to have expressed dissatisfaction in their closed door meeting at Baidehe uh, with the, the state of the economy and the state of things in China at present, because the economy has been in a tailspin. It's not in a good place. Um, the days of double digit growth seem to be behind China and growth has been moderating. There's high level of debt. The real estate sector at the moment is uh, in serious difficulty. So there is a sense, uh, there's very high youth unemployment. China has stopped putting out figures of youth unemployment. So there is quite a bit of domestic pressure as well, which is building up on Xi. The third reason we are being given is that Xi, prefers to create his own blocks, you know, or to give emphasis to the groupings where he feels China uh, carries more weight. In the G20, there are Western countries, there are Russia and China, there are developing countries. So it's a mixed bag. And the virtue of the G20 was that it straddled two divides, the East-West divide, because you had the US and the West, and you had China and Russia, and the North-South divide, because it had developed countries as well as emerging and developing economies. And if now the G20 gets mired in geopolitical differences, it would be a great pity. Uh, that's what it is looking like. Therefore, the question, will we have a Delhi declaration? There is some hope. It's not all lost, but if it doesn't come, uh, will that take away a bit of gloss from India's G20 presidency? Look, uh, the world is far more divided today, uh, especially relations between the great powers are much more fraught uh, with the Ukraine conflict than uh, they were when G20 was first set up. So today, progress is going to be far more difficult. You have a direct conflict between Russia and Ukraine and a near proxy war between Russia, the US and West through Ukraine. Uh, on the other hand, the US-China strategic competition has also been heating up in the economic, technological and geostrategic realms. Now, it's our hope that these great powers are able to agree 
to isolate or insulate their differences over Ukraine and work around them because the global challenges that we face are becoming far more urgent to address. You know, climate change, you've seen the whole world sweltering this year from Europe to America to India. India, temperatures over 45, 46 degrees in summer. Southern Europe, temperatures over 40 degrees, forest fires. I think we really need to come to grips with these issues, how to deal with the future global pandemic, how can we make it more efficient, how to, you know, to uh, resuscitate growth in the global economy, and how to accelerate the achievement of the sustainable development goals, how to get the global finances that would be required for these. These are all compelling issues. And if the great powers are unable to agree to find a way forward on these, then it would be irresponsible global citizenship. So my hope is that we can at the last minute after going down to the wire, find something which allows us to move forward. But if we can't, then there could be an outcome statement or an outcome document in which India can summarize all the issues on which there was consensus and which could not find mention because of the differences over Ukraine. That would be a pity because it doesn't have the weight of a joint statement, but uh, also I would say that India has put many substantive proposals on the agenda, and these are going to shape the future agenda of the G20, irrespective of whether there is a joint declaration or not. Under the Brazilian presidency, many of these proposals will be further discussed, will be carried forward, and the progress that we are likely to see is going to be incremental because these are not issues which can be resolved overnight, but require multi-year action by countries working together and acting in coordination. Mira Shankar, my final question to you. Uh, as a citizen of India, someone who spent many, many years in the foreign services, for you, what is it like to see India hold the G20 presidency? And, uh, you know, what does India take away from this? Well, I think India's weight in global affairs is growing. Of course, the presidency is a rotational presidency, so it goes to each G20 member by rotation. But clearly, India is in a special spot at the moment because it has good relations with the US and the West, and it has good relations with Russia, even though relations with China are not where we would like them to be. Uh, it has, uh, uh, you know, some elements of a developed economy, including its high-tech sectors, and yet the rest of the country is clearly a developing economy. So we straddle all these divides and are in a good position to act as a bridge, bringing the world together rather than deepening conflicts. All right. Uh, Meera Shankar, it was good to have you on the show. Thank you very much. You've set up the big... Modi-Biden bilateral, which is scheduled uh, in the next one hour or so. Also, uh, the big outcomes from the G20, from India's G20 presidency. We leave it there for the moment. Thank you very much for joining us. Let me go 